When you meditate during a Dharma talk, pay very little attention to the talk. And give your primary attention to the meditation, what you're doing right now. Focusing on the breath. If you find the mind wandering off, you bring it back. The talk is here to help help you realize when you've wandered off. It acts like a fence. You run up against the fence and you turn back to the breath. And it's also here to help point out things you might notice in the breath. Ways you can deal with the breath that help the mind to settle down, to help it feel secure, happy to be here. Because it does take a while for the, the mind and the breath to settle down together. And during that period of settling down, the mind can get discouraged and get bored. It can find all sorts of reasons for not being here, which of course aborts the process. It takes time, and you have to give it lots of space and as few interruptions as possible. So the mind can begin to notice that the act of focusing on the breath does give it a better place to stay. As the results gradually build, gradually build. The breath is smoother. The energy in the body has fewer conflicts. It seems to flow together. And it gives you a good, stable place to stay. This is an important principle, giving the mind a good foundation. Because without that foundation, it can't really see clearly what it's doing. To see where it's made its mistakes. There's a lot to learn from your mistakes, and yet most of us don't like looking at them. We pretend that they didn't happen. If something goes bad in life, we tend to blame other factors, either other people or things totally beyond our control. And there are times when problems do come from outside, but you're not responsible for them. You're responsible for the areas where you do have a choice. That's what you want to look at. The Buddha once said that one of the signs of wisdom is recognizing your own foolishness, seeing where you've made mistakes, because that gives you an opportunity to change your ways. As he says, a fool who recognizes his own foolishness is to that extent wise. But even then, there are foolish and wise ways of looking at your own foolishness. The foolish way is to say, I am a fool which closes off a lot of opportunities. If you are a fool, what are you going to do? There's not much room for improvement. But if you can tell yourself, I've been a fool, that opens the possibility that you can change your ways. And how do you recognize that you've been a fool? You see the consequences of your actions. You did something and it caused harm, either to yourself or to other people. And you had the choice. You didn't have to choose to do that. Now that recognition right there teaches you some important principles about actions, that you have choices and your choices have consequences. Always keep that in mind, because that insight is the beginning of wisdom. And what caused you to make wrong choices? It can be several things. Faulty intentions, faulty perceptions, paying attention to the wrong things. 
And all of these are areas where you can look into the mind and see exactly, okay, what was my perception of the situation? Why was it wrong? Or what were the signals that were coming my way that I was ignoring? Well, sometimes you may have read the situation properly and the signals were loud and clear, but you basically said, to hell with it, I'm going with what I want to do. That's your intention, that's your, your, the element of will there. And so when you recognize this, you realize these are three big areas where you can investigate. What is your intention? What is your perception? What are you paying attention to? And as meditators, we learn how to explore all three of these areas. We're taught to pay attention to the question of where is there suffering, what's causing it. This can start on the blatant level around us and also move into the mind. Like when you're meditating here right now. What ways of breathing, what ways of focusing on your breath are causing stress? That's the issue you want to focus on. Then you might ask, is it the way I perceive the breath? What kind of mental picture do you have of the breathing process? Where does it feel that there are barriers in the body? that prevent the breath energy from flowing in. Do you perceive the body as a big bellows with only a tiny little pair of holes where the breath can come in? How about changing the perception? How about thinking of all of your pores as areas where the breath can come in so you don't have to pull it in and push it out? And think of the breath permeating everywhere through the body, like you're surrounded by a big sieve. It doesn't require a lot of pushing and pulling to get the air in and out. That's one perception you can work with. And you can find other ways of perceiving. You might ask yourself when the breath comes in, what direction does it flow in the body? Does it flow up? Does, if it's flowing up, is it causing headaches? If you find that that's the case, let it flow down. There's a famous Zen monk, Hakuin, who began suffering years back, and we're talking several centuries back, what was called he called Zen sickness. And basically it was an excess of energy up in his head. So his way of curing it was to think of this huge ball of butter on top of his head. It was gradually melting. So each time he breathed in, the melting butter gave him the perception of energy going down, down, down. So you can try that if you find that that's a problem. And of course, as you're meditating, you're dealing very directly with intention. Are all the members in your committee on board with the desire to say with the breath? Which ones are not? When they're not on board, where do they want to wander? What are they looking for? As the Buddha says, when you to get the mind to settle down in right concentration, you have to seclude it from unskillful qualities, you have to exclude it from sensuality. Sensuality here means your obsession with sensual pleasures. All too often the mind finds it has the opportunity, a whole hour with no other responsibilities. You can think about, <coughs> think about sights, smells, sounds, tactile sensations, flavors all kinds of things. Plan tomorrow's meal. Reflect on today's meal. But you remind yourself that doesn't really accomplish anything. 
The Buddha once said, if you find yourself obsessed with sensuality, you'd be better off sleeping. And he says he never really encourages sleep that much, but this is one case where sleep is better than just obsessing over sensuality. Of course, still better than that is to be able to get the mind to get out of the sensual realm and into the realm of form, which is what we're dealing with when we're working with the breath energy in the body. So if you find the mind wandering off to sensual pleasures, remind yourself this is not the time for that. If it's really obsessed, you can remind yourself of all the dangers that come from sensuality. And there are many, many passages in the canon where the Buddha describes them, describes them or gives examples, gives analogies. to undercut the, the glamour and the allure that sensual pleasures have for us. He says you also have to seclude the mind from unskillful qualities, and this can be anything from wrong views, wrong resolves, any of the path factors that are wrong. It's that wrong resolve that's really important, though. Is there anything in there that's involved not only with sensuality, but how about thoughts of cruelty, thoughts of ill will? I don't know exactly why, but for the past couple of days I've had a lot of people coming and complaining to me about extremely unfair situations. People have been behaving unjustly. And of course, the immediate reaction, encounter something like that, is to want to get back at the people. Of course, that doesn't accomplish anything at all. You have to learn how to set those thoughts aside, reminding yourself that what they do is their karma, what you do is your karma. And you can't ultimately be responsible for their karma, but you can be responsible for your own actions. So you spread thoughts of goodwill, which are not simply thoughts, may they be happy, but also may they understand the causes for true happiness and really act on them. And that's a thought you can have even for people who are really cruel. In fact, you really want to have that for cruel people so they can stop their cruelty. So sometimes it's good to do preemptive strikes before you settle down. If you know that the mind has been obsessing about a particular thought during the day, you've got to do some antidote thinking to pry your mind loose from that. Other times you find you don't even realize what the problems are going to be until you start settling down with the breath and something springs up that you didn't expect. Something that was just below the surface and now has a chance to come up to the surface. Sometimes you start thinking about regrets, things you did or said in the past that you really regret. In that case, you spread thoughts of goodwill to whoever it was that you harmed. Remind yourself you will resolve not to repeat that mistake, and then you get back to the breath. Realizing that the mind that is well-centered, that has a good solid foundation, is much more likely to be able to stick to its intentions, its skillful intentions, stick to its resolves. So in this way you find that as you meditate, the lessons that help you wise up when you realize that you've been foolish. You're taking those lessons and you're working on them to strengthen them. Looking at your intentions, looking at your attention, looking at your perceptions, realizing that these govern what you do, and what you do really is important. There is a clear distinction between skillful and unskillful. And you don't want to act in unskillful ways. You've seen the harm. So this is the wisdom of wising up. Just the simple fact of realizing that you have been a fool in one way or another. Teach you some important lessons. Teaches you that you have choices, and your choices do have consequences. And the choices depend on your views. 
which are made up of the way you perceive things, the things you pay attention to, and your intentions, what you would like to achieve through your actions. These are all important. This is why the Buddha focuses on these elements as being crucial to what shapes your life. So when you think about the Buddhist teachings, you know, sometimes we hear the Buddha taught there were four noble truths, and three characteristics, and five hindrances. And say, so, well, four noble truths, why not five or why not three? And why does he focus on the things he focuses on? And all too often it's easy to write it off as some sort of cultural thing or some personal proclivity. But it's good to remember that it all of his teachings have their roots in some very common human experiences. In particular, the, the wisdom of wising up. Seeing that you've been a fool. Not that you are a fool, but you've been a fool. It's an important distinction. And taking to heart the lessons that come, that have taught you that you were a fool, but you have the opportunity to overcome that foolishness. That's one of the root realizations that led the Buddha to teach the way he did, and to focus on the things he focused on. To take that wisdom of wising up and see how far it can go. Mm -hmm. 